Um, I've been to events and discussed with wise people about the meaning of tourism for many years, and you heard a bit of my history. Um, and one of the conclusions I came to after all these years was summarized for me by a man in Vienna a few years ago, who was a senior guy from TUI. He said, telling tourism to change is a bit like changing, asking the weather to change. It's a waste of time. You have to focus elsewhere. And I thought this was a rather startling thing from a guy who's in charge of one of the biggest mass tourist companies. And he said, no, we can't change. We're an ecosystem driven by uh, algorithms and values and business models that is not about individuals changing their minds. You have to look at the destinations. Stop trying to tell us how evil we are when most of us know it. Um, we need a new angle. And so uh, I'm showing you a picture of the moment that I had that discussion with a guy from TUI in Werberg in Austria, because that was the moment when I realized that to make any progress in this uh, discussion, and not just a discussion, but in the practice of trying to change tourism, we need to uh, reframe the question. And that's why I've done a bit of Zoom now over the last weeks, and I'm gonna give you my takeaways first. And then for those of you who need to then kind of disappear and come back in half 20 minutes, you can do that. But I thought it would be good in the frame of what the guy said to me about, don't think about tourism, think about destinations. Here are my three takeaways. The first one is that, um, you know, the world is filled, never mind tourism being a business, there's a huge infrastructure of think tanks and critics and magazines and conferences about tourism as a phenomenon. I think we have to shift our question towards healthy places as the focus of our work. Don't think about destinations, which is the language of the tourism world, but think about local living economies. And that's what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is, is that change of emphasis. Second takeaway is that nothing I propose is based on some kind of conceptual shift. I'm going to tell you about a few examples of many thousands of activities that are already happening, in which people who, for whom these places are their home are taking action to adapt to changing economic and cultural circumstances, never mind whether they've been told to do it and before the COVID crisis and so on. So they consider that their home is places they can make better in different ways. They don't worry about the notion of the destination. And my third takeaway, which I hope will be the most uh, thing we can talk about, is that yes, there are a million interesting activities happening around the world, um, but they need to be coordinated. They can thrive and do better if they can be connected and framed and clustered. And this activity, um, the activity of connecting people to each other, of connecting places to each other, it requires a form of social infrastructure. And that if, as the Commissioner of the European Commission said four days ago, there is to be a Marshall Plan for tourism, it should be a Marshall Plan of social infrastructure investment and not one about building large, expensive things. And we can come back to that at the end. But I want to start by, with you know, Jakob had some pictures of Venice just now. I spent a bit of time saying, what is happening in this nightmare situation? Why can't people tell these cruise liners or other forms of sustainability to just stop? And somebody said, John, stop thinking about the culture, just follow the money. And so one way of thinking about the forces of nature, so to speak, or the forces of capitalist nature, that drive this expansion is that just one of those hideous boats, they, the average price paid by one of the passengers is $1,800. It comes to Venice, disgorges many thousands of people who wander around wrecking the place for the day. And at the very most, they might leave $7 for a coffee and a sandwich. Maybe they spend $5 on tourism. There's an insane difference between the money that is made by the proprietors of that boat and the people who are on it. And so the, the, the so-called destination, it's like an extractive industry of the purest and most brutal kind. But we all hate cruise liners, but there are other forms of tourism and other forms of visiting and travel, which aren't much better, frankly. 
So festivals, which started off as small and rather sweet things 30 years ago, have become another branch of another extractive industry. This is one in Portugal called the Boom Festival. Average spend, according to one of the researchers, between $700 and $2,000 by the time you've gone there, bought the ticket, traveled and so on. Average, probably a large average, left behind for that part of Portugal, $200 ahead or less. Another, again, insane inequality between the size of the tourism economy that's floating around and any benefit that might be having to the place. And then this is my favorite example because there's a lot of um, activity about something called sustainable tourism. And this is uh, Le Monde did this survey a while back in which they looked at what could be more sustainable than some very you know, nature-loving French guy going to Morocco and going around with a donkey, well, those numbers speak for themselves. So Jacques pays somebody 2,000 euros to organize it, maybe 250 of that stays with all the intermediaries of Morocco, local guys, maybe 50 euros, the mule gets zero, obviously, for doing most of the work, um, and then there's another 900 euros disappears into the system somewhere. So under the general heading of follow the money, you can see that tourism has expanded to in the, you know, all these decades um, because it's a very profoundly effective form of extractive economy. And I just realized recently it's very similar to the whole food thing that also agonizes us. It's um, a similar ratio. So if you go into a supermarket and buy food and you spend 10 euros, for example, on some food, the farmer who grew it and did all the work and takes the risk gets at the very most at one euro, so you have this similar disparity. So in both cases, the place where the, the value is created gets no attention for that extracting value from the experience of the place as a transaction. So that's to kind of cut a very big story short is the story of the last 45 years when uh, Joost Krippendorf first used the word sustainable tourism as a concept. And quite frankly, despite all our critiques and books and conferences and uh, jumping up and down, 45 years later, the marketing guys have made lots of money out of sustainable tourism with these brands, but the actual impact on the world has remained not much less negative. And so that brings us up to today. So despite our critiques and our campaigns and our activism, the only thing that has actually made any material difference was a virus. And that was something that I don't think anybody expected. You can have some remarkable uh, entertainment, if that's the word, by looking up parked planes on the internet. There's an amazing variety of these pictures. Nobody expected this to be the reality. And I suspect that maybe some of us watching and listening today would say, good, let's hope those planes stay grounded. The, plant, the planet can't afford it. We have to kind of let it rip. However, at the same time as the planes being grounded, something like 27 million people have lost their jobs just in Europe since the, uh, the shutdown. Three million small local firms, cafes, small food shops, never mind the big bad ones, the small ones, they're also in danger of going extinct. And I think that's why we can't just regard this as an interesting cultural game. And so how do we balance? the desirability of one of those planes, planes flying again with, on the positive side, finding a way for a life for those guys, like the tour guide on the left, or the small millions of small firms. We can't just say too bad, for we, others can, but we can't. This brings me to the second part of my talk, which is that in many of the former destinations, as the tourism industry calls them, an incredible variety of new livelihoods and good work have been emerging over the last years, not in response to the crisis but of COVID, but in response to the depredations of the economic shift since the, in the last 40 or 50 years. People have not waited for concepts or designers or academics to tell them what to do. Incredible variety of interesting things have been tried out. And my work as a kind of writer and a collector of these stories has been to go and find out what people are doing so to speak, in response to the opportunities in their own place to find a new way to create livelihood and to create value for themselves. 
I think 10 years ago, I did this show you can see in the background in France, which was basically looking at a 50 kilometer radius around a city and saying, what is happening in the countryside? It's new and interesting, and not particularly recognized by the mainstream economic or media system. And then the kind of things to do with soil repair, making stuff and so on. Those words crop up throughout my work and they're the basis of what some people have called a foundational economy, the things we need to live. Millions of incredibly interesting experiments in adverse circumstances in which people uh, re-fashion for themselves the urban-rural relationship. Just, uh, so this is last November when I was lucky enough to go to China and spend a year there saying, okay, what is happening in China with this incredible out of control development? Are there signs of a new relationship between the city and the rural? Is something to do with nature percolating what looks from outside like an insane consumer culture? And so we did this big show called Urban Rural, which was entirely containing examples of relationships between urban and rural people and communities that had not for the most part been imposed from above, but had emerged from people looking to fill this gap. And it was an amazing experience doing that research. And one of the projects which has just completely blew my mind then and continues to do so is called Farmer Live Streaming. So all the last 20, 30 years, my work has involved, how do we make a better connection between the people who grow food and the people who eat it in the city? That, you know, remember that woman in the supermarket who pays 10 euros for some shit and then the farmer gets one euro? Well, in China, they are now doing an amazing revolution in creating this platform of relationships in which farmers basically talk to the city directly about their land, about their lives, about their food. It's called farmer live streaming, and it's nothing fancy. It's just that somebody, in this case Alibaba's Taobao, said, "Oh, let's if that's what's required, let's just do it." There's a very famous guy who sells eggs um, by just showing pictures of his chickens, you know, two hours from Shanghai, and people kind of ask him questions or and you press a thing on your phone, and the eggs turn up the next day. Um, nothing conceptually fancy but it profoundly changes the kind of mental relationship that you have with somebody called a chicken farmer as well as the kind of economic and um, social one so this uh, phenomenon which was uh, didn't even exist two years ago fifty thousand rural farmers are now uh, engaged in some form of live streaming and the taraba which is the platform one of two or three platforms they reckon that Another, another 200,000 farmers by the end of this year. And the top 10% of these guys who are doing this uh, live streaming are now earning eight times what they were earning before and were eight times the average income for a small farmer, of which there are 230 million in China. So you have a complete transformation about the urban rural economy, the, the, the self-confidence and the sort of sense of security of farmers done just very quickly, independently of all our discussions about the evils of tourism or the evils of people trampling around other people's communities. But coming back to Europe, I showed you this picture of this tour guide. So some friends of mine in the last month have been saying, well, okay, if there are now 27 million people without a job and 3 million small firms, if China can reinvent the relationship between farmers and people in the city, can't we do the same between people in our own tourism and urban rural economy? And in a design jam of just a couple of weeks, uh, these guys looked at all the different ways that one could take the assets that were already there, small restaurants, tour guides, local community people, and reconnect them to each other in different ways. So I'm, I can't go into detail about it. You can see on the right one of the kind of, you know, the sequences in which these connections would be made. But the restaurant has a way in this kind of, with this platform to provide people to buy food. The local people who are in lockdown can get these, you know, get meals without having to go out shopping and so on. Very practical, simple stuff. But all these connections have to be designed and engineered and organized. And that's the crucial part of my story. 
Here's a third example. This is from the south of Italy, where there are something like five and a half thousand more or less abandoned or about to die villages. Another example of where tourism is kind of partly blamed for people leaving the countryside and going up to cities or tourism comes and buys up places and turns them into horrible sort of uh, situations. This is a town called Grottoli. This is a group um, some, with some friends of mine called Casa Netral, uh, based in the south in Basilicata, who have now for seven years been finding different ways of working in and with these villages to create new forms of livelihood, good work. Not the, the word tourism is hardly ever used. It's saying we need livelihoods, we need to do good work so that we can find a way for younger people to stay in the villages. And it's extremely inspiring, but very low profile. And what it boils down to is saying, you look at what appears to be an abandoned and ruined village, but if you go closer, you talk to the people who are left, you'll find all sorts of resources ranging from cooks to buildings to traditions to histories and stories and then the secret is how do you take these things which are still there and turn them into experiences and activities that can bring life back into the town and that has now become the sort of basis of a new profession called being a village host in which the practice of looking for what is has potential whether it's a person or a place, connect them together is, is a completely different form of activity than being a tourist sort of developer because the, the village is the client and the subject and the control. And then if there are tourists or visitors, then fine, but the whole dynamic is owned by the village. And I'll come back to that at the end. This is uh, on the general subject, we talked about ecology. It's a huge thing, but I just think the cultural desire amongst millions upon millions of people to do something practical to bring nature and damaged uh, ecosystems back to life is huge and it's not just in you know my opinion it's you're beginning to see bigger numbers of people going to places um, in different parts of, and donating time donating skill donating uh, expertise to the physical restoration of ecosystems if you check out the eco restoration camps or through that uh, link you'll see that well two years ago i think there were three of them now there are like 30 or 40 and they're growing like crazy because people in all walks of life all ages all backgrounds they say we don't just want to kind of be critical of development or to moan about the crisis of biodiversity give us something practical to do which they're now doing in many many different countries people turn up and start to plant things and uh, you know restore rivers and so on. Here's one in England in a not at all kind of radical um, context in the southwest. The bioregional learning centre works with groups that are physically restoring rivers bit by bit, ten metres by ten metres. I love this map on the left because each of those yellow dots is somebody with a, a septic tank or a cow pissing into a stream where it shouldn't. The people go around and say, let's get rid of all these yellow dots, which are making our water impure. And then they do physical stuff on riverbanks as well. Hundreds upon hundreds of groups doing this in their spare time, making their kind of world healthier without it being part of the kind of tourist or any other form of recognizable economy. Many schools are just taking unilateral steps to involve their students in different ways of growing stuff and restoring gardens and so on. It's kind of the parents want it, not all, but a lot of growing number. The children want it, the teachers want it, the school system resists it like crazy because they want everybody to be learning how to do things with technology. But there is a kind of incredible strong grassroots movement of connecting children to growing things and soil and so on that is it's not tourism, but it's connecting, getting people out of their normal situation, doing something meaningful. This is in Scotland, where friends of mine run something called the Cataran Eco Museum, in which children are learning about their place, their geography, their culture, their, the agriculture, the, all sorts of things, by being reframing the kind of places where they live as part of their classroom. And so rather than being 
a field full of very abstract information, which is the default mode of education, their learning and their kind of sense of solidarity with their place comes from exploring it. Botanizing the subject of learning about nature. I need to speed up a bit. Um, there's a list of just some of the urban rural connections that I've connected and you know others. The point is there's a lot of them, um, but they don't organize themselves. And so the third and final part of my talk really is about this notion of the infrastructure that's needed for more of this to happen. And I have a theory of change. This is my one theory slide from Ilya Prigogine. And he said that when a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence have the capacity to shift the entire system. And so just imagine that those are little islands of coherence, which I choose to believe are like the projects that I find scattered around. They're all there, but they can be connected together in ways that give the potential to change the system itself. This is totally true of the alternatives to tourism and the alternatives to passive consumption to travel that we all want to see. It's all out there, but scattered and not connected. There are people who are doing it, discovering what is, exploring what if, connecting places and actors and values in new ways, but they don't have a profession. They don't, for the most part, get paid. They tend to do it as individuals with a passion for their place. And this picture tells me, I'm now over my limit, I'll go on for one more minute, the difference between um, a support system as the industry would imagine it for developing tourism as the supply of products versus what I'm describing a support system for all those different activities that I've talked about. So to my, and this is my friends at Participatory City in London, the support system enables the connections to be made between all those different actors. And so when I use the word social infrastructure, that is what I mean, a support system that enables all these uh, existing places and people to collaborate better. A Marshall Plan for Tourism should therefore, in my judgment, be about finding ways to strengthen that support system. And that's what the, the European Commissioner said we must have two days ago. And that is basically about teachers and people doing things to connect other people to each other. So if I told you about the, the live streaming, the woman on the left works for something called the Taobao University. She teaches farmers how to do live streaming. That is a form of social infrastructure. I told you about uh, the Italians bringing villages back to life. That's half a dozen people in that building in the south of Italy, a school for village hosts. They teach you how to do it. It's developing the skills of connection. I told you about the children that parents want to get in touch with nature. There are schools all over Europe now called the Bio Canteens Movement, where the school itself connects with farmers, connects with the countryside, and creates those relationships that have been missing. And why not think of the office itself as a form of social infrastructure? There are tens of thousands of those now looking for a new role or the public libraries of the world and Europe, or the old post offices, the local shops, all of these have the potential to be the social infrastructure that we need. Uh, I'm going to stop there because I've gone for 22 minutes, but the three takeaways are the same that I told you at the beginning. Healthy places, not destinations. New activities uh, are already happening. And that the Marshall Plan for Tourism needs to be about the social infrastructure of coordination that I mentioned. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I went on a bit longer. Uh, anybody wants to read more, there's my book, special ebook price since the last week. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening.